Mr. Clark, you said here last night that you thought that perhaps um, this might be the last opportunity for the world to ensure the peaceful use of outer space. What did you mean by that? Why do you think the, uh, the, it has become so urgent now? Well, because the first anti-satellite systems have been tested experimentally. See, until now, all space systems have been peaceful. The only military space systems have been non-aggressive. They've been for communication or for surveillance. And the surveillance satellites have, in fact, helped to maintain peace by revealing both to the Russians and to the Americans what the real cap what was really going on. And when you have knowledge, you have a much greater degree of security. So all the military, all the military satellites so far have been benign. In the last few years, the first anti-satellite systems have been tested by the Soviet Union. And therefore, President Reagan has announced that the Americans must do the same thing, and we'll have again this escalation if it goes ahead. And this, if possible, should be stopped. Are you confident it can be? Of course it can be. I mean, it, mankind can do anything it determines to do. And there's tremendous pressure at this conference to stop this race. And I was interested to see in the Russian statement that the, Mr. Brezhnev himself said we must prevent the militarization of space. So everybody agrees. What's the argument about? How effective do you think um, outer space technology of outer space, particularly Earth observation satellites, might be in establishing or maintaining peace? Well, the suggestion was put forward first by the French government and is now is the subject of a UN report that there might be an international monitoring satellite. Let's call it a peace sat which would provide for the whole world what, at the moment, only the Americans and the Russians have, a system for surveying military operations so we know what is going on. And if such a system was in existence, then there might not be military adventures such as the recent unpleasantness in the South Atlantic. Do you think that the uh, superpowers will resist such a proposal? From what I have heard, I don't think that they would, because it's to the benefit of everybody. Well, um, can I ask you then, uh, looking ahead, as you so often have, and without um, anticipating some of the things that we'll be seeing in the United States in your forthcoming television series, if you could nevertheless give us an overview of where you think we are moving in space between now and the rest of this century. What are some of the things that uh, you think we might see by the year 2000? Well, of course, space is an enormous subject, and uh, we can divide into the manned and unmanned uh, uses of space. As far as the unmanned side, we have the communication satellites, the weather satellites, all these things which everybody takes for granted now, which are part of everyday life. And there's the scientific exploration of space, which is continuing, although it has fallen off. And it's a great pity that um, the United States is not going to Halley's Comet, as indeed the Japanese and the Europeans are doing. But on the man side, which has much of the glamour, of course, the shuttle is a center of attention now. And the shuttle is of great historic importance. The shuttle, well, at one time we hoped it would be the DC-3 of space. Let's say it's the DC-1.5 of space, but that is the beginning of reusable space vehicles, the utilization of space on a regular routine basis. In the very near future, p paying passengers are going to go into space. Uh, within this decade, someone is going to go to NASA and say, here's money for my ticket and I'm going to go into space within this decade. Has anything that's uh, happened in space or in the opening of uh, space surprised you? Yes, I think the speed with which everything has happened. I was interested in space first in the 1930s. I joined the British Interplanetary Society in 1934. And I remember that we, none of us believed we would see this in our lifetimes. As late as 1948, Eight, when I wrote my first novel on space flight, Prelude to Space, I very optimistically put the first landing on the moon in 1978. I didn't really believe it would be that soon. Well, of course, it was in 1969. Now, the speed of development has been unbelievable. Well, finally, very quickly, can I, uh, can I invite you to, to speak of your uh, forthcoming, uh, the sequel to 2001? I, I'm sure you can't betray what it uh, finally resolves itself as, but... Um, um, what should we expect in that forthcoming film? Well, no, first of all, there's no film at this stage. This is a novel. In fact, I've written it without any thought of making a film, though I'm quite sure that somebody will try to make a film and I wish them luck. I have sort of half-jokingly said I've tried to write a book that even Stanley Kubrick can't film, but of course there's no book that Stanley Kubrick couldn't film if he wanted to. Now, in the book, which is a far better book than the earlier one, because I had no such constraints, I was able to write what I wanted to and just 
develop more characterization. I go back into the past from 2001 and also into the future, and I've been able to use the Voyager discoveries. And here's a fantastic thing. When I wrote 2001 with Stanley, we put the first exploration of the moons of Jupiter in 2001. Who would have dreamed that within a little more than a decade, we would actually have spacecraft there and would know what was out on the moons of Jupiter? Well, I've been able to use this knowledge in the new book. So both uh, in your fiction and indeed in your, uh, your uh, expectations, uh, you remain an optimist rather than a pessimist. I tell everybody that I'm an optimist because I think we have a 51% chance of survival. <laughs> Thank you very much, Arthur C. Clarke. Thank you for talking with us. Now, you... There's... Okay. Arthur, the last time we talked was at the Air and Space Museum in Washington. At that time, you accused me of being young enough to be your son. At this point, I feel old enough to be your brother. Uh, what I'd like to ask you, in your book, in uh, Childhood's End, you were, to my mind, wise to see that mankind grows up. And yet, in a way, possibly the children can teach us something. What would you think of having a way in which children could actually meet with each other so that we would not have any more incidences like uh, children being taught to hate, as in Northern Ireland? Well, of course, space uh, communications, in a way, have already helped children to meet all over the world because uh, everybody, at least in developing countries where there's television, they see what's going on in other countries. And in the development of international telephone dialing, you can, uh, you can talk to each other so easily. So our present space technology has helped in this respect. You know, I would like to see a world in which all children spend a few years being brought up in another country, a country with a different language completely. Uh -huh. So that every child will be at least bilingual. And the improvement in communications through jets, as well as the telephone system, does enable this to be possible. I remember a line from South Pacific, you've got to be taught to hate. And uh, we can unteach people as well. Yeah, it gives you a headache, that's for sure. Uh, the uh, thing that find, I find very interesting is the fact that children now are already communicating. Did you know that they are now making slow scan television, uh, amateur television communications with each other through uh, the Oscar satellites? I didn't know this, but uh, the idea of the electronic blackboard is uh, uh, one which I put forward many years ago. I'm sure it's not original, but over the telephone circuits you can send drawings very easily. And another interesting thing to do is the way in which the children are adapting to computers. I mean, we're having, there's a quantum jump here, maybe a discontinuity, a generation is rising which is computer literate, whereas people like myself will never really be able to understand how to use computers. We had two girls in uh, NASA for, for launch vehicles that did so much better than the men. I think most of the men felt a certain nervousness about how much superiority they had. Um, and an interesting thing that probably helped us give uh, communication was stamp collecting among children. Uh, I would like to give you a set of stamps from Czechoslovakia and a first aid cover. If you don't collect them, I'm sure you know children that oh, do. Oh, yes, yes, I'm uh, well, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. yes. But uh, we've been working with children now in about 13 countries where they now have large stamp collections. They write to each other. The next thing they want to do is build their own satellite, uh, an Oscar satellite, to be ourselves for slow scan television. And my dream would to be see, as uh, you have said before, having an educational satellite system where great teachers of the world, like yourself, could talk to all universities. How do you feel about that? Well, a global university or a global satellite educational system, all these things are possible. And incidentally, in Sri Lanka, the government is setting up a training center for satellite communications, as well as for energy and space technology, and perhaps robotic, which they're naming after me, rather to my embarrassment. Why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're just modest. That's all. And um, well, I hope that might be one of the center of this sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I've been invited to the Sri Lankan Embassy in the United States to uh, carry on with this Good. membership for the Star Foundation. I'd like to ask you if you'd be interested in also in acting as an external advisor once a year from your own home without having to come up by television. Well, uh, shall I wait till this is over? Yeah, we can edit this out. It sounds it has nice ambience, so it doesn't sound yeah. like the train station's yeah. all over again. Well, uh, to, answer, uh, to answer your question, I'm prepared to do anything that doesn't involve A, traveling, B, answering letters, 
through <laughs> or see money <laughs> at this point. Listen, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you find this a very successful trip here to Austria. Oh, We've certainly good. been enjoyed meeting you again after all these years. Thanks again, sir. Do you need a ride back? No, I'm going. Oh, okay. 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 Dr. Clark, one of your famous laws is that if an elderly scientist says something is possible, it most certainly is, but if he says it isn't, it may well be possible. Is there anything that falls in that category that you can tell us about today that's coming up in the future? Well, I think one thing does fall squarely under that law is the so-called orbital tower or space elevator. Uh, the concept of an electric elevator from a stationary orbit down to the equator. You see, if you can establish a satellite over a fixed point on the equator, which of course is what the communication satellites do, then in principle you could lay a cable from Earth to satellite, and you could run payloads up that cable and establish a vertical, a vertical railroad, if you like. But the engineering problems are enormous, but they do seem technically soluble. So this is a case. We're not. It can be done in theory. Many scientists would say it's impossible in practice, but I suspect that it is possible. I'm. I guess I'm an elderly scientist now, so I come under Clark's first law as one who thinks it can't be done, but I think it can be done. That was the basis of one of your recent novels, wasn't it? What I thought would be my last novel, The Fans of Paradise, and what, but now, as you know, I've been persuaded to write the sequel to 2001, so it's my penultimate novel. What might such a uh, orbital cable be made out of? A material exists today or developed in the future? The only thing that could be used at the moment is rather expensive, diamond. <laughs> but ultimately, I'm sure we will make materials that are rather cheaper than diamond that could be used to construct the orbital tower. Carbon fiber, perhaps, which of course diamond is carbon. You sort of have to find a diamond that could reach forever. <laughs> a diamond a lot bigger than the Ritz. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Clark. Okay, thank you very much.